Hey guys, Boy here. In this video is brought to you by Analog and Me. We decided to create something never done in video format before, and this is the Bible of Void Spirit. The Bible of the Mid Lane is a collection of information mainly brought to you by Analog and then condensed into a video packed with information at every turn by me. In this video, he's revealing tips, secrets, and things that very few mid players even realize about Void Spirit, since it's such a new hero. The order of this guide will be slightly odd, and this is because we understand that the Generation Z players have small attention spans. We will showcase you the hardest matchup Void Spirit has to teach you something you probably never saw, and then we will talk about item and skill builds separately. If you don't care about that, you can just jump to the next matchups and watch for yourself. This is a very, very hard matchup for Void Spirit, and because we want to showcase as much information as possible, consider this guide very, very similar to Viper, and that's why he's not included in this video. That said, the matchup is as hard as your bracket and the Husker player you're facing is. Analog and I are going to show you two scenarios of this matchup, starting with the hardest one when the enemy is actually good. Husker is a beast at the moment, and thus, laning versus him is a waste of your time. In this video, we'll teach you how you can still have impact even though you're not laning, and, well, you probably already guessed it, you have to cut waves, ideally from level 1. When you're in the Radiant side, according to Analog, the right way to go about it is following this path instead of the mid lane one, because the tower gives enough vision of that entrance, and if Husker notices that you're cutting waves prior to the creep spawn, you're in big trouble, since you will have no TP and the supports might actually get to you as well. On the Dire side though, there's a little caveat. You see, when Dire is playing, if they have brain cells, they will never ward here, and that's because this ward gives no vision of the rune, and that's why it's easy to sneak on Dire from the angle we showed you when you're playing Radiant. That said, on the Radiant side, this cliff is very often warded, so for you to infiltrate through this angle, Analog suggests two ways. Team coordination, so that you can take control of this area and outpost, pushing Radiant away until the rune spawns, so you can position to cut the wave. Or, you can ask a support for a smoke, and then you can sneak through this angle, since Radiant doesn't get vision of this part of the map. And if you leave the vase fast enough, you're probably reaching this area when everyone is already in the low ground close to the outpost, so you should be fine. Husker is almost a melee hero, and so Analog recommends that you ward the cliff, not only because it's harder for the enemy to find it, but because you want vision of the enemy supports as you drag the creep wave around, allowing you to maybe bring the creeps to the right side instead of the left one and just dodge them accordingly. The great thing about this is that Husker himself cannot follow you, or else he risks losing all of the creeps, and on top of that, Husker is actually awful at last hitting under tower, meaning you start the game in a way bigger advantage than if you just chose to lane. After making this double wave, Analog can now walk back to the mid lane, knowing he will have a way better time getting CS under tower. Unlike Husker, Void Spirit has amazing base damage and animation, so less hitting under tower is actually okay. What you don't want happening is this. See how laning versus Husker once he gets level 2, 3, and 4 is impossible? Analog got about ACS at 5 minutes when he tried to lane versus Husker normally, and we're gonna show what happens when he cuts the wave. Husker can dominate the lane really hard, forcing you to take like 3 spears for 1 creep. While Analog gives up this 1 wave, this is still better for him in the long run. Also, note how he always kills the range creep at the start, so that he can get the boost of experience and also eliminate the creep that deals the highest amount of damage on him. Once you're level 3, you can actually cut and farm the waves quite easily because of your damage block. Husker has no wave clear whatsoever, so chasing you is really hard for him, and would imply in him losing experience and gold, while you will be aware of him coming, since if there's creeps hitting his tower and he's not showing, he's after you. That said, in a normal game, you have to expect supports rotating at some point, and if they don't, you actually farm everything, just keep kiting the creeps and moving sides, instead of tanking everything like a Dumbo, you actually want to be moving at all times. It's important to know that Analog fared a salve after the first time he dragged the wave and came back to the tower, and that's important, you really want that extra HP boost, and that gives him some breathing room as he tanks through so many waves of creeps. Another relevant thing to talk about is how Analog always waited to use Resonant Pulse after killing the ranged creep once, so he doesn't waste mana and deals as much damage to the melee creeps as possible, because he's waiting for the next wave. If eventually you get ganked, you should be saving a skill point of W to try and escape with a TP to the mid tower or base if you're really, really low. As you can see, while Analog is one level behind Husker, there is a huge creep wave margin to his tower, and he has 16 less hits, whereas in the other matchup he went against the Husker, he had around half of that. 
the real challenge usually starts after the minute 5 wave. While Dragon Eclipse worked till this stage, you cannot leave the Catapult wave for Husker. The Simulate is actually really good versus him in scenarios like this one. Not only you can dodge Life Break with it, juke him in the trees when he tries to man up on you, you can also dodge a significant amount of Burning Spirit damage if he somehow got on top of you in the first place. With the tower defended, you already overcame the hardest part about this matchup. Analog played this really well, and in his words, even at this stage you cannot kill Husker, so what you want to do is bring someone middle so that you can kill him. Avoid going for it if he already has armlet though, because it's quite unlikely that you will kill him unless you have a level 6 AA or a hero that is really really good versus Husker. That said, if your supports can't or will not rotate, avoid laning versus him at all times when the creeps are meeting close to his tower, and just tech for you and try to rotate to other lanes when possible. Do you want to get your replay analyzed by Analog and me? We're giving away one replay analysis a month to a lucky winner that joins our $10 Patreon tier. Check it out! Now here's the thing, following this video, you will have item build, skill build and important concepts about the hero being laid out in front of you. The idea is that you don't have to watch all 9 matchups to gather most of what we want to transfer to you. There is obviously a ton of things in the specific matchups part of the video that are not here literally, but that's the idea. We don't want to repeat anything to have the fastest video that can deliver you the highest amount of content. To understand the item builds for Void Spirit, you have to remember he's a hero with 4 actives that deal magic damage. No Talisman is incredible in this hero, and so you're probably going to get two of them almost every game. But that doesn't mean you're always rushing them. Botto is another amazing item in the hero, and it's a way to have mana to secure range creeps and get sustain against hard matchups. And also a way for you to rotate after level 6. The general rule for initial items is... Start with this if you're rushing Botto, and rushing Botto usually signals you're in a hard matchup. And then you can go for this. Analog suggests starting with this, if you're getting a no talisman before bottle. This usually signals that the matchup is not awful, and so you can get away with the no talisman for extra harass, lane domination, and all of that beautiful stuff. And you can start with these items against Monkey King, Razor, Ursa, anything that forces you to get boots. When you can trade versus a hero, no talismans are awesome and should be a priority. When you can only hope to use spells to get CS, Botto allows you to tank the damage from the enemy hero and also get mana for the spell usage. And when boots are needed, so you can cast your spells and not die, you get boots into Botto. If there's two intermediary items that Analog wants you to consider, these are the ones. Raindrops are very good versus the likes of Windranger and Shadowfin. Stick is amazing versus Windranger, Shadowfin and Cop, heroes that spend more than one spell constantly. And that's pretty much it. Not that hard, huh? Skill build. More often than not, you're going to skill Resonant Pulse at level 1, and you're gonna max it at level 7, no questions asked, but some matchups require you to learn to simulate at level 1 or 2. Heroes that have super obnoxious level 1 spells like Razor Static Link, Quops Dagger, may force you into level 1 to simulate. Some heroes might require you to get dissimulate at level 2, so let's say the enemy has a Mikanka and a Murana. The axe can set up a perfect arrow into a kill, so accounting for how much kill potential the enemy mid hero plus any roamer has is something to keep in mind. Monkey King is also a hero that level 2 can deal a ton of damage with Balance Strike, so the simulate can be a good choice against the hero so you can dodge the damage. For analog, the best build available right now in terms of DPS is 404, and that's because W is really hard to land, especially in a solo lane, but that doesn't mean you should be 202 at level 4 all the time. Unless you're going to kill the enemy mid laner and you need the damage from Remnant, save a skill point for Dissimulate since the spell is actually very good defensively and offensively. Your W has much more damage level 1 than the extra damage you get with another point of Remnant, and if someone ganks the enemy mid, landing W is reliable and so that spell is gonna be better. At the same time, if you get ganked, either Remnant level 2 has much less impact in saving your ass than learning Dissimulate. So that's pretty much the core about skill building this hero. Monkey King vs Void Spirit is a hard matchup and it's no hard to imagine why. That said, we are here to teach how to face Monkey King and at least not get crushed. In this first footage, watch how Analog doesn't give Jingu straight away. The range creep isn't about to die, so he just chills, and then gets CS with Resonant Pulse. This matchup, Ursa matchups, are all about understanding and being pro-efficient at drawing aggro with max range while not giving too many stacks away. The key point about playing this matchup is understanding whether Monkey King can get 4 Jingu stacks on you or not. Does he have boots plus Arbovinum and you have no boots? Well, you should avoid even one hit and just draw aggro. But if he went Wraith Band and you have early boots, chances are you can take the second attack as you disengage and still be fine. 
The difference between him getting three attacks and four is huge, and that's the real secret on how not to lose a lane versus Monkey King. But that sounds kind of obvious, right? Here's a great example. Analog has no boots, Monkey King has orb, and instead of trying to get CS directly, he positions himself diagonally to the Monkey King and draws aggro to the tower so that he can get CS and not give away any advantages. All of that with the beautiful Aether Remnant to get the range creep. Against hard matchups, what you're really doing is just using your two nukes to get range creep plus whatever creep you cannot get with drawing aggro plus right click. For you to do that, you need mana, and thankfully, versus Monkey King, it's not that hard to control the runes since you have much better wave clear than him and he's gonna be under tower. Good Monkey Kings will contest your rune though, so tread carefully on how you approach just going for the rune. A good tip so that you don't get out denied by Monkey King when he gets Jingo Mastery is to try and pair your right click and resonant pulse at the same time. Since the skill has no cast point, this isn't hard to do and suddenly your 80 damage attack is now 150. Another thing we talked about that this clip shows is how to pressure Monkey King even though it feels like you should never hit him. Because your hero has great wave clear from the get-go, whenever you see a wave like this full of creeps while Monkey King runs to his tower, use your remnant to get some damage onto him. As long as you have a zero counter on you, it's just not worth for him to trade as long as you disengage after the first attack. But be aware that after level 3, this dynamic changes a little bit and you have to be extra worried about it. Look at this trade between Monkey King and Void Spirit when they are both level 2. Because of Monkey King's awful armor and Void Spirit's quite decent armor, he tanks a full Jingo stack and the trade is kinda even. One analog tip so that you can lane better versus Monkey King is getting a point of Dissimilate at level 4. You can get it at level 2 or level 4, just don't get it at level 3 because getting more damage block is your priority. Your ability to get range creeps and mitigate physical damage is more practical and overall more useful, but watch how analog dodges the balance track damage right here. One thing we probably have to tackle right now is the build Analog went for in the matchups up to now being different than the ones suggested right at the start. Analog was not quite sure Monkey King was a hard matchup versus Void Spirit, so he went for the greedy build or the normal build for most cases to see how he would fare, and needless to say, it didn't go all that well, so just go for the build we suggested. The matchup can become easier than what we showed, when instead of rushing no talisman and bottle, you pick up fast brown boots. In this matchup, when he goes for this build, we can also see a pretty interesting way to play the lane. See how he draws aggro right from the gecko? This pushes the lane faster by default, and so even though he uses Resonant Pulse for a melee creep, he can now tanks to the creep advantage, hit the range creep, get level 2, harass the Monkey King without giving away Jingo stacks. Getting a fast level 2 is crucial in a matchup like this. It can transform a normal dive that Monkey King will usually be able to pull off and make up by using Balance Strike on multiple creeps plus you later into a death. Regardless of that, Boots allows your hero to draw aggro without giving any Jingo stacks away, which just gives you more mobility to risk taking one hit for a range creep and overall just play with much less fear. Speaking of the dissimulate point, watch how Analog gets solo killed even after level 6 when Monkey King gets Jingo stacks, just because he doesn't have it. I guess the summary of the matchup is, get Boots to not die, get Bottle so that you don't die and you get CS, and eventually, just rotate, because it's unlikely that Monkey King will die to you even after level 6, especially if he's smart about getting raindrops. The only likely way he dies is when he dives too much and gets punished by the tower damage and his own lack of armor. This is the less hard matchup we're going to be talking about in this video and also the easiest of the hardest matchups in analogs in my opinion. What you have to understand about Razor is how important not keeping a static lane is for you to win. To create a non-static lane you have, for the most part, two options. Using spells to push the wave or drawing aggro to your tower so that your lane pushes faster and that's really good for Voice Spirit versus Razor. By doing this, you distance yourself from Razor's really high damage, since even with the Simulate, he will zuck some of your damage. And you're also forcing Razor to last hit under your tower, and maybe, if he drain your damage right at the start of the lane, he will not have extra damage. Look how the second wave looks like he pushed so much, that now Razor is forced to last hit without stolen damage, and this also means Analog will have a pretty good time last hitting in his tower later, since it's going back and forth. On top of that, he blocks his wave after last hitting, which in turn keeps the lanes not static since he puts the next wave under tower aggro. And that's pretty much what you want to be doing. Razor ends up being able to cast Static Link at around 1 minute and 35 seconds, and the first time he used it was around 25 seconds. Meaning, while the cooldown of Static Link is 40 seconds, Analog almost doubled the effective cooldown of the spell by messing with where the creep wave is and his positioning. This will make your laning versus Razor 5 times easier, and it's quite a simple concept to execute. The second concept Analog tells you to utilize to win this matchup is being aware of the cooldown of Static Link so that you can trade versus Razor once it's down. 
Razor actually does nothing versus melee heroes now that the passive only deals damage when he has the ult. So trading versus him is super effective for you since you have the damage block. We can see the same posture once the debuff is over. Just make sure you have the Simlade ready when Razor goes on you so that you can escape. Speaking of scaping though, if you're playing against a good Razor player, be aware that if he stands right in the middle of the Simulate, the link will not break immediately. Playing with the direction you're going while being very aware of where exactly he is in the circle is how you immediately break this annoying spell. Ultimately, what you want to do is get to level 6, and at that stage, your hero actually gets skill potential on Razor because he's not the tankiest hero out there. Make sure to control rune since you do that pretty well, and you'll be in a great position to crush your games. Shadowfin is a weird matchup. You would think this is a really hard matchup, but in reality, this matchup is kind of similar to Void Spirit's brother, Storm and Ember Spirit. As half packs a lot of damage on melee or short range heroes until level 6, what happens after that is all of them have gap closing abilities with burst damage on top of it, and thus the advantage can be quite deceiving, if you will. How do we get past the initial advantage then to dominate the matchup the hardest? The first part is understanding that up to level 3, Shadowfin is actually not that much of a threat if you follow these tips from Analog. This matchup is similar to Razor, in the sense that you don't want a static lane after level 3, and to accomplish that, you don't even need to be as radical as you did with Razor, drawing melee creep aggro straight up and giving your range creep away. In that matchup, you want to be away from him at all times, whereas in this matchup, at least up to level 3, you're only worried about taking damage when one of your creeps is low and you're nearby, so the raise is gonna hit both of you, because that's when Shadowfin will be raising most of the time, so as long as you avoid having more than one raise charge on you, you're gonna be okay. And for the most part, you can actually attack creeps as long as you're aware of Shadowfin's mana to get CS, denies, and even push the wave. Look at this clip. Analog had a raise charge and he realizes Shadowfin really wants his range creep. Since SF takes his time to get it though, the charge wears off and instead of trying to compete for a deny against a 90 damage raise, he instead attacks him. This is 200 damage that he dishes. As the wave continues, see how easy it is for him to get denies? What's the difference from this scenario to the other one? Well, any good Shadowfin will raise for a range creep, that you're in position for a deny. While it's common to also do that for melee creeps, Shadowfin is using a finite resource that might be lacking when a range creep is about to die, so making sure to try and bait those when you don't have like 3 stacks of raises on you is really important. As long as you don't try to deny every creep and tank every raise, this is something you can reliably do versus Shadowfin up to level 3. Once Shadowfin gets level 3, your posture has to change a little bit. Watch how Analog draws aggro here, but even then, Shadowfin will find ways to pressure you, and that's why Bottle after No Talisman is necessary. Don't forget to get Region with the No Talisman recipe, since you will take a fair amount of damage until your Bottle is done. That said, checking SF's mana is the way you get kills per level 6, and is the way you have to play this lane in general. You saw a ton of harass coming from him, right? Watch what Analog does once he realizes Shadowfin only has one raise left. He trades once, And after the cooldowns are back, he engages again. Even gets the range creep whilst he gets the first blood on top of it. Going back to the laning stage, we already talked about this, but it's worth repeating. Because Analog draws aggro constantly and starts moving the lane back and forth, he has opportunities like this one to harass the Shadowfin when the lane pushes. Drawing aggro at max range, just like we did against Monkey King, is also key. We can see Analog doing it here with this melee creep flawlessly. One problem you will face versus Shadowfin is rune control. Because he has much better wave clear than you in the early stages, he will push the wave in a way you will struggle to do much against. That said, you shouldn't play passively. Watch this clip for instance. Analog takes a double race to the face, but it was a short and medium one, and by manning up with shield, you can see he tanks the right clicks, he damages the Shadowfin a little bit, buying time for the charges to wear off and his bottle to come. The last tip Analog gives about playing aggressive from Shadowfin is to always commit hard when you go for him. In this footage, SF had just used a long race for a CS. On top of that, he didn't have a ton of mana in the first place. Watch how he dodges the short range race. Checks the mana, making sure there was no mana left, to then slap him. As long as you fully commit and you don't take a triple raise, you will deal more damage to him than he's able to do to you. While most heroes struggle versus Kanka, Void Spirit is unique in the sense that he has pretty decent base, HP and armor for an intelligence hero. Usually you're going to trade evenly against Kanka until level 5, because that's when the damage and cooldown of Tidebringer start to become quite annoying.
A good tip to deal with Kanka after level 5 is actually a little counterintuitive. By standing in front of the creep wave, really close to Kanka, he will struggle quite a bit to deal the Tidebringer damage on you, and that actually allows you to trade really effectively versus him. While your shield cannot mitigate the Tidebringer damage, it does reduce the damage in case he attacks you with Tidebringer, as you can see in this clip. Another tip to kill Kanka when you're both level 6 is to weight the bolt damage reduction, and by doing that, Analog secures a kill here. Going back to the early levels though, Void Spirit is good versus Kanka because he has insanely good attack animation. This allows him to almost never get his range creep denied by using Pulse plus his attack at the same time and by denying a ton of creeps since his attack animation is faster than Kanka's. As long as you rush bottle and you trade directly versus Kanka instead of taking the Tidebringer damage, you can actually be fine. Look at the difference between the damage analog takes. We can actually see Analog trying to mirror the Kanka's movements so that he doesn't take Tidebringer damage here, and that's another great way to actually handle him. Watch how Kanka has to go behind his Creep Wave if he wants to hit Analog, and not only he can out deny Kanka before he can hit the melee Creep, he prevents Kanka again. In the next wave, we see the same thing. Kanka wants to hit Analog, the range Creep, but because he moves all the way to the right, he doesn't take damage. Getting good at this is what turns the matchup from hard into even, and while it might take a few games, it will change all of your melee matchups forever. This matchup is quite the weird one. Quop usually loses to heroes she cannot reliably dagger, and Void Spirit is one of them, thanks to your ability to simulate. At the end of the day, laning versus Quop is as easy as you're good at dodging dagger with your W, or as hard as Quop decides to use Scream of Pain to harass you, since it's a way harder to dodge spell. That said, I don't believe most Quops are going to do that to you, and maybe this is a tip for you, Quop player, whenever you face one Void Spirit in lane, maybe consider not maxing your dagger. While Quop is usually a lane dominator, you don't care about half of her dagger since the cooldown on Dissimulate is higher than the cooldown of dagger, and you also have amazing B18 attack damage, which makes the lane very annoying to her. The only real advantage Quop has over you is the fact that she can control runes much better. The overall idea of this matchup is to play as far away from Cop as possible when she has dagger so that you have enough time to dodge it and then play in her face once it's used and the cooldown is not back. Remember though that you will not have the simulate back before dagger is up so time your aggression just like analog does here. When you get to level 6, as we saw with almost all matches we showed, Void Spirit has a ton of kill potential on Cop, especially because he outreaches her blink at level 6 since you have a double blink pretty much. At this stage, you also can threaten runes because of Astral Step, but remember that before this stage, you can always try and set up on one side of the river to see if you can get lucky picking up a rune. As we got to the easy matchups for Void Spirit, Analog noticed something quite interesting about this matchup. Let's go back a little to Husker. Remember how we told you to skip waves and pray to God that no supports rotate on you? That was an easy matchup for Husker, and thus the enemy felt like awful. Well, most easy matchups for Void Spirit don't look that menacing to the enemy hero, and that's because this hero doesn't have the resources Husker and other heroes have to send you back to base. Void Spirit relies on cooldowns, and while he becomes a monster at 6, his kill potential is not that big until that point, even against easy matchups. The outcome of easy matchups for this hero is just more farm, less harass taken, etc. One very important point Analog shows about this matchup can be seen here. In a lot of matchups, we saw Void Spirit drawing aggro to his own tower to get CS there, but this is a favorable matchup and one Void Spirit trades really well. And that's mostly because all of the Pango damage is physical. So not only he gets CS with his shield while he damages Pango, he's taking 3-4 hits of physical damage that mean nothing to him. Even though the disarm can be annoying, there's very few matchups that are easier for Void Spirit than this one. This tip from Analog might be a little late into this guide, but it's still worth talking about. Basically, avoid learning your level 4 skill point unless you're going to use Q to kill someone, because learning W in a gank many, many times is the different maker on whether you survive or not, and while Penguin is an easy matchup, you shouldn't always blindly learn Remnant at 4 for no reason. Another thing is worth talking about and that goes beyond this matchup too, is faring a self prior to you thinking you need to use one. As we talked about, you want to be constantly trading with Pango, and while you, on average, will deal more damage to him than he can deal to you, sometimes when the passive procs, you might get into a spot where you're afraid to trade, and that's never what you want, especially in a winning matchup. So watch how Analog buys a salve, even though he was somewhat close to the bottle, but not like 10% HP, just so he can keep the pressure up. 
We already talked a ton about this hero's animation and damage, and because of that, it's almost impossible for you not to be 6 before the Pangolier, and that gives you a ton of chances to get solo kills. As long as you don't fuck up like Analog did here, Pangolier will more than likely die, and even if you do fuck up, you don't fear Pango getting level 6, since you have two mobility spells that makes Rolling Thunder plays in the lane almost useless. The Void Spirit versus Invoker lane is easy. Quasvex Invoker is the best Invoker to play versus Void Spirit because he's way too mobile for the damage from Meteor or Sunstrike to ever hit him. So banking on tanking his mana and cold snapping him so that his cast points are punished a little bit are probably the best way to handle the hero. And yet, even Quasvex Invoker is a joke versus this hero. While he has a ton of HP regen and probably will not die, the damage and animation of Void Spirit are so good that he barely gets any CS. Watch how Analog makes his mission to deny the range creep here, and even with Cold Snap, Invoker fails to get it. Since you probably will not kill Quasvex Invoker before level 6, what you want to do is just choke his experience gain to the limit, which, as you can see, is not hard. One thing to mention in this matchup that is relevant is the fact that your shield is dispellable by Tornado. In this moment, Analog held the shield because he wanted to get level 3 and cast a higher level one, since Tornado was used, but in general, it's a good idea to use it after Tornado was committed to make full use of the ability. Trying to deny range creeps after Invoker is level 3 is probably not a great idea, since just like SF, you will tank the damage from a spell and probably get your shield dispelled, but in this case, we just saw Tornado being used, and doing that is both easy and harmless for Analog. This matchup is just easy, and the way Analog likes to abuse it is to get 3 no talismans. Invoker is a hero you have to burst down, so the nulls definitely help in that regard, and they increase your damage, which in turn helps you snowball this matchup even more. Draining mana with EMP requires extreme precision against you, as you can see, and so Analog, unless he's the one that initiates the aggression, risks nothing laning and being this greedy item-wise. Watch how he plays aggressive after Tornado EMP is used to zoom him out of the lane. This matchup kinda reminds Void Spirit vs Monkey King, but in this case you were the monkey. While Monkey King will never die if he just lane vs Void Spirit, if he played aggressive enough, he risks dying, and that's the same thing here. Invoker can only actually hit you reliably with Tornado EMP if you initiate and kinda lose a little bit of mana, and while Analog was trying to milk the advantage as much as possible, he almost dies, so be careful. Finally, Wind Ranger. Probably not as easy as Invoker until level 6, since Wind Ranger actually has decent ways to secure range creeps and to trade versus you better. But Wind Ranger's kit sucks versus Void Spirit, and she lacks the sustain, like Quasvex Invoker, to not get killed at level 6. Good Wind Rangers will use Power Shot on you constantly, since it's not physical damage and it's also low cooldown. And while that's good for Wind Ranger, the fact that Wind Run is useless versus this hero makes her a sitting duck after you get 6. Astro Step has True Strike, and every other spell Void Spirit has is magical, it doesn't care about Wind Run. While her ult, that gives her kill potential on most heroes, gets severely countered by the damage block from Resident Pulse. We talked about this already, there's probably no hero that gets crushed to the ground against Void Spirit, but Wind Ranger will struggle to get CS, has no kill potential on you, has worse room control once you're level 6, making her completely garbage while you can kill her as long as you harass her enough before you commit for a kill. In this matchup, for instance, Analog has 48 CS versus 25 of the Wind Ranger, and that's not even counting the fact that she dies once she tries to make her move. Hey guys, thank you for the feedback so far. It's been amazing to delve so deep into different heroes with Analog and learn so much about playing mid. And we just wanted to remember you guys about our Patreon. We love doing these videos, but they take hundreds of hours, and that's really the way they will become sustainable for us in the long run. Don't forget about the $10 tier promotion, where you can get a replay analysis made by me and Analog, and make sure to give us feedback on which hero to cover next. Have a good one.